Hello, and welcome to another episode of Working in ArcGIS with your host, Phil Miller, from the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources. We're currently working on a little project that we have this year, and one of the things that I am noticing is that we're having a couple issues dealing with map packages and sharing files and uh, editing those files. So I wanted to go over uh, one process, this is one method, for actually working on a shared map package or a uh, map package that is shared with you. One of the things that you'll notice is the map package really is just a bundle of information and you can't really see the geo database that's backing it or the MXD that's backing it. So one of the things that we need to do is we need to extract this map package into its individual components allowing us to see them. So this is one of the phases that we're going to do. The other phase is what happens once we extract that map package, how do we edit some of the features that exist within that map package? So we want to do this in according to the NCGMP09 now released GEMS data model so that we can actually work with these files and collaborate with other authors. So one of the first things that we do is we need to go ahead and take this map package of a partial geologic map and extract it. So we need to go ahead and open Arc Catalog and navigate to the location where we saved our downloaded map package. It'll be um, something like this. It'll have this symbology, which is a little uh, box with a map logo. Um, the file extension is MPK. And once we get to the location of that, we can see our MPK right here. And what we want to do is we want to come to our toolbox, expand data management tools, package, extract package. This allows us to unbundle our box of information that our map package holds. So we'll drag and drop our map package in here and I'm going to extract it directly back into this folder. And remember, everyone's uh, folder format and folder structure will vary, so make sure that you follow the folder structure of the organization you're working in. So I'm going to output to this folder location. And once that finishes, we'll see what we've done here with regard to extracting the map package. I'm also going to do, while that's working on extracting, I'm going to go ahead and open the map package. I'm doing this so that we can see all of the components that go into a map package. We can see that it really is a complete collection of all of the elements that go into making an ARC map document. Here is our opened map package and we can see that if we look at our list by source, we have the location of our geodatabase, which is buried inside of that folder that we were looking at inside the MPK geodatabase. And we'll see that in just a second when we go back to our catalog. But I want to show that it contains all of the information from that map package, a map, a layout, and the geodatabase associated with that. So it's a very convenient way of sharing files with other users or other authors that bundles everything together so you don't have to worry about broken links or anything like that. We can just share this package directly with other users. They can collect that information and then they can edit it directly in here. But we want to be very careful about this because we don't want to get confused about how this um, gets saved and shared back to other users. So I tend to either you have two choices. You can either work directly in this map package, save your edits, repackage it, or, um, and reshare it. You can email the package back as it is. Or you can extract it and make some notes about how you've edited it. And that's the method that I tend to work with. I actually like having a documented history of all of the steps along the way, especially when sh sharing and working with collaborative authors. 
it just makes it to where we know all of our steps along the way and we're also making backups of these things if we do this process. So I'm going to close this map package. I'm not going to save the changes. Here we are back in Arc Catalog and we can see that our extract package process has completed. And now we can see that inside of our folder location, this is the MPK that we extracted. This is the location that we extracted it to. We can see now that we ended up with a common data folder, a V10 folder, and a V10.5 folder. And what this is, is it took the package, extracted it into its components that is common data between all of them, and then made version 10.0 compatible files of the geodatabase and the MXD and version 10.5 compatible files. And what this tells me is this person when they made the map package was actually using version 10.5. We can see that there's a 10.5 compatible version of the geodatabase and a 10.5 compatible version of the MXD. In version 10 it has the same components but this one would be 10.0 compatible. So as long as you're working in version 10, you can open either of these projects and actually be able to work on the data regardless of what it was made in. It's one of the nice things about making the map package is it tries to make it compatible for the vast number of users that it can, so long as you're working on the same base version at least. <clears throat> okay, so here is that map package, and here is the common data folder. And what I'm going to do right off the bat is I'm going to come into here and I want to rename this as my from folder. This is where I got the data from. And I want to preserve this to the best of my ability so that I have a backup to get back to should I need to. So I'm going to state who I got this from and when I got it. And it is now out of date as of this date stamp. So this would be 2018-04-09. And you don't need to necessarily include who you got it from. That's a thing that I do on my own folder. It's just so I understand that I got this from someone and when. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the 10.5 version folder because that's the one I'm working on. And I'm going to paste it into here under a folder of the geodatabase name, paste it in here. Now I know that I have the current working folders that I can work from, uh, current working files, excuse me, in version 10.5 that I can start working from. So I can open up this MXD specifically and have it looking at this geodatabase. Now I broke some of the links so it's not going to be looking at this geodatabase specifically, but we know how to repair our data source. But I am now no longer editing the map package itself. I'm working directly with the MXD document. And I have also preserved that MPK so that if I need to, I can get back to this point. I've made a backup effectively of the data at the point that I got it. So we can now go ahead and close our catalog while the MXD for this quadrangle is opening up. It remembered the location of the geodatabase, but some of the common data, the uh, link to those files broke. So let's go ahead and repair that data source. And it's because we changed the name of it from Laguna to Laguna from colon 2018-04-09. So all we have to do is navigate to that common data. And the common data is probably stuff you shouldn't be editing anyway, because it's not in the geodatabase proper. OK, so now that we've repaired those links, we have everything that we need to start working on this map. I am going to start an editing session to start working on some of the areas that are missing. So if I turn off our hillshade, 
we can see that there's areas inside this map that have yet to be mapped. And we want to edit some of this. So this is where we're going to start from here. We'll switch to our data view. I'm going to turn off, turn off the topo temporarily just for editing purposes. And now we can see that we have holes in here. And one of the common comments that I have is that if you're working with a geodatabase, so long as you have map unit points, when it comes to the map unit polys, you can always make them faster from the contacts and faults and the map unit points than you can by editing the polygons and the lines that make up those polygons separately. It takes more time to edit both of them than it does to edit the lines and then make new polygons from those lines. So we'll go through that simple process in completeness, in entirety here. But <clears throat> my comment is still valid. It's better to work with the contacts and faults than it is to work with the contacts and faults and the map units. It just adds an extra complex step that you don't necessarily need to do. And ARC can make these polygons much faster than we can editing them individually. It's just a much faster process. So let's see that. We have our polygons here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make those unselectable. I want to prevent myself from accidentally selecting those when I start an editing session. What we want to be editable is contacts and faults, or selectable. What we want to be selectable is contacts and faults and map unit points. The other thing is if we have any stations that we want to add in, we might as well make that editable too. Same for if we have any orientation points, any strike and dips. So, make these selectable based on what you're going to be adding in or editing to your map. For my purposes, I'm really only going to be editing the contacts and faults and the polygons. So all I need to have editable are those features, the contacts and faults and the map unit points. And that's what the list by selection in the uh, view is used for in the table of contents. It's really convenient because I can only then select what I need to start selecting. So if we start an editing session on the geodatabase, I cannot accidentally select those polygons and mess them up. I can select the contacts and the map unit points. So those are the two things that we're going to be editing directly. One of the areas that we want to edit is we want to fill in these polygons. So if we really wanted, we could, and I'm going to just be drawing arbitrary features from here. I want you to recognize this is not actuality. This is just the idea or the concept of how to edit things in a geodatabase, how to edit things in a partially completed map. So let's do the example of adding in a terrace unit just to the north of this geologic unit. So we've started our editing session. If we have our Create Features tool up, we just need to find the contact that corresponds to the type of line we want to use. So let's say that this um, contact is certain the existence and identity are certain and the location is accurate. So here is that. And we should go ahead and zoom in to the area of interest. So from here, I can go ahead and add in my terrace unit. And there's lots of ways to add these lines in so that they're smooth. One of the things we can do is we can use streaming. We can use individual clicks like I'm doing here. If you want streaming, you hit the F8 button, you click a point, and then you start moving. And this uh, tolerance, the stream tolerance, can be edited a number of different ways. So 
Now, I've drawn in my line and the points are closed, so you can either hit F2 to finish the sketch or right click, finish sketch. And you'll see that, that reminder to click that you can press F2 to finish that sketch is right here. So for this time, we're going to click the finish sketch button, but for the most part, I tend to use the F2 key. So we have now blocked off what will be a future polygon. It's not a polygon yet, but we'll deal with that in the end. So we need to now come over to our map units, uh, excuse me, our map unit points. Click on our map unit points and place a point what will be inside that polygon area. So there's that point. With this point still selected, we need to open the attributes for that. So I have it opened up as an individual window already. To see that, because likely that won't be up, if you go to Editor, Editing Windows, and click on the Attributes window, it'll open up a new window pane that is this. And from here, we can go ahead and type in the information we want. So it doesn't need a map unit poly ID. But for map unit, we said that this is a quaternary terrace, and this is the second order terrace. The identity confidence should be certain. Its label should be QT2 as well. Its symbol should be QT2 also, and this can change from map to map depending upon what you're doing with that. <clears throat> Notes, this would be a good opportunity to state Oops, I need a cap lock on it. We saw it in the field on April 1st in 2018. Every user should have their own unique data source ID. So, for each map, let's put it that way, a unique data source ID for each map. I am going to call myself data source 007. And the point type is a map unit. And we can see that the created user has edited based on my username, the date it was edited on. And then anytime I come back and edit this, or if I make changes to this, this will update as well. What's bizarre is my system time is, uh, oh, it's probably done on universal time code, not on local time code. <clears throat> okay, so now we've created this. And one of the things that I like to have done is I really like to make sure that my map unit points is labeling. Based off of that map unit field. And the reason why is I like to see that my map unit is in fact labeling so that I have a visual reference for what that polygon will become when I remake polygons. So when I remake polygons, this point will inform this area that it needs to be QTSJ. And this point will inform this area that it needs to be QT2. So that's one way we can add in a contact and make a polygon from that in the future. <clears throat> we'll see that step further. Let's go ahead and do another change. We want to split an existing unit into another subunit. So I'm going to zoom out. And I'm going to zoom into this area right here. So let's say we actually want this unit... to be split and this contact continue so that this unit is QFO. So let's do an example of that. So where we want to start is, again, we want our contact. I want it to continue from this point. I'm going to turn on my streaming by clicking F8. I'm going to go ahead and draw in my contact. F2 to finish the sketch, 
And now we have to put in our map unit point. Technically there's already one here, but let's do this as a reminder. We click in here, we come to attributes, we call this QFO. And if it's not certain, we can type in label is QFO, symbol is QFO. Notes if we have any, I am data source 007. This is a map unit. <clears throat> okay, so now we've got an issue. Geologically, we can't have a contact separating a unit from itself. So we need to delete this contact. However, this contact is long. So what we want to do is we want to split the contact at the intersection of this and select it again and split it here as well. Now what we can do is we can select that contact and delete it and then when we make polygons after we've done editing all of our contacts we can either delete one of these or leave them both. It'll go ahead and label it off of this QFO. And the way ARC tends to work is it starts in the lower left hand corner and works its way across and up. So it will run into this one first and then this one second. The, the point that it runs into first is the unit that it labels. So it will be QFO the first time, it will be QFO the second time. The reason why I bring this up is if we have a point in here that conflicts with this, it will label it QFO. It will label it the first one it intersects, starting in the lower left hand corner and working up. So now we have a decision. We can either delete this con this point or this point, or we can leave them both. I tend to like only having one so that there's no confusion about it. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this one. And then we can ignore our polygons, because remember, we're going to make polygons again. So that is splitting, quote unquote, a polygon into another one. Now, if we wanted to change the contact type, so I made this a certain contact, what if it was actually approximate and I goofed? We can go ahead and select that, and in here we can change that information. So currently this says it's a contact whose identity and, is identity and existence is certain and its location is accurate. We actually want to change that to be approximate. But where we really want to change this is in this symbol field. The symbol field holds the key for identifying what the line type is. And from my FGDC codebook, I know that an identity and existence, a contact whose identity and existence is certain and its location is approximate, I know that that code is 01.01.03. .01 and we can see that this is now changed from a solid line to a dashed line. So if I were to change this back, now it's a solid line again. It's through the symbol field that it changes. That's why this is green highlighted. It's the field that the symbology is actually using to identify and draw the line type. So I'm going to change that back to 03. This now says that it was done by uh, Colin and he did it using field work and air photo interpretation. And I can say this was changed by 007. So I changed it based on the recommendation of another author. And we'll notice that my line type shows that created and shows my edited time. So that's one of the things that's neat about this is it updates those fields dynamically. If I were to select this one, we can see that this one was originally created by Colin Sikoski. And because I have now selected it, it updated it based on the fact that I'm going to change it. And it updated it when I changed it by splitting it into a separate line. 
If we look at this one, this one should remain unchanged. I have not done anything to it. So that's one way we can edit uh, a line type that already exists. That is the basics of editing line work. And that's the focus that I want to impress upon this is we're editing the line work. We're adding in contacts and faults and map unit points to fill in this void or to alter the existing geology. And that's the basis of what we want to do. We want to be able to edit this and alter it to our specifications. If we don't like what a unit is labeled, let's use that as an example. I am uncomfortable with this being QBLP. I can select this map unit point and change it right here. And once I've changed that, then when I remake polygons, that unit will change. So we're going to do this. I'm, and this is just a test example. This is not accurate. I'm going to call this unit. It's a tertiary unit that's unestablished. So I have now changed the map unit. Let's change the label to match. Tertiary unit unestablished. And now when I make polygons from these points that I've made, we'll see the effects of that. So we have a polygon here and a polygon here. We've deleted the contact. So when we create polygons again, that should not happen. So we need to first save our edits. Remember, none of our edits are saved unless we save our edits. So that's one of the points of caution. If you've worked for five hours and your computer crashes, if you haven't clicked editor, save edits, none of those changes have taken place. So make sure to come back here and click save edits often. Let's go ahead and stop editing. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open my Arc Toolbox, and that can be um, the window can be opened from here. I have mine opened up and docked. Data Management Tools, Features, Feature to Polygon. What this says is what we're going to do is we're going to take our lines. and convert them into a polygon. We can have polygons and convert them into polygons. We can have polygons and lines and convert. What we're doing is this process right here. We're taking a line input and a point input and outputting a polygon from them. So our input features, our line features, are our contacts and faults. I'm going to save this inside that geodatabase. And I'm going to call this a temporary placeholder that I made on that date. This could mean that these polygons are old because of the date stamp. The date stamp denotes an age they were created on and could be old from that point on. So that's what that date stamp is for. So we're going to go ahead and make that happen. And then our label features, where it's getting the information for what the area represents, is from our map unit points. So we use our map unit points that we've put in, and we're going to make polygons from that. So watch what happens here, here, and here once this process is done. Okay, so we've made polygons. Currently, this polygon has no information. It is unidentified. Oh, it's labeled QFY. Somewhere it's getting a QFY label. So there's a point in here that's calling it QFY. So that may mean that there's an open contact, an unclosed contact, or a label, a point that's in here accidentally. So we'll look at that. We look at the one we just made. Sure enough, it got that QT2 designation. By me. The test unit is now labeled test, and this polygon is all one continuous polygon instead of being separated like it was. Now, this doesn't work as well as, say, 
this was with its colored. So let's go ahead and add in some colors that help us understand what we've done and potentially find any errors. The easiest way to do this, I find, is to go to Categories, Label off of Map Unit, Symbol off of Map Unit, excuse me. I don't like having lines around my polygons because I want to see what the contacts are showing me. I want to see where the contacts are dashed, dotted, or solid. So I make the output width zero, change this to no color, say OK, and then click Add All Values. And here are all of my polygons. We can see that we have 47 unlabeled polygons. I tend to make these either obnoxious green or obnoxious red so that I know that those are incorrectly labeled or have no label. And then everything else will color based off of these parameters. And we can adjust these based on what we need. But for the purpose of this demonstration, let's leave it alone. And now we can see that some of our lines don't exactly jive. Some of our polygons don't exactly jive with what we think we should be seeing. So I'm going to drop this below our contacts and faults. And we can see that these two are labeled exactly the same thing. Even this is supposed to be QAL. So this is getting QFY. This one's getting QAL. So there's a Q or QFY. Although there's a QAL here, that could mean somewhere around here is a polygon, a, a contact that's not closed out. So I'm looking for the location where this polygon is getting that QFY instead of that QAL. right there. So that's where that QFY designation is coming from. It should actually be QAL. I'm not sure why this got QFY because it should be working from that bottom left to top right. So this should have been the second one I've encountered and this should have been labeled QAL. So maybe they've changed the method that those polygons are created. One of the other comments I'll make is we have some unlabeled polygons right here. No map unit, no label, no symbol. This polygon has no idea what it is because it's missing a map unit point. So that's another area that will have to be come back, that you'll have to come back to and actually put a map unit point in. And it's really nice because we know from looking at this, if we open our properties in symbology, we can find out how many of them there are. So currently I see three right here and we can see that there's 47 of them total. So those are 47 polygons that will need to be addressed with a map unit point. So we have some others of the outliers that we can see up here. And all that needs to happen is we make a map unit point, we place a map unit point in here, make polygons again. I tend to go through this uh, set by set by opening the attribute table, start an editing session on the geo database, select the unit, select the polygon, and then there's a couple ways we can handle this. We can view only the selected one, and we can put in a point in there, one of the other things we can do is list all of them that are missing. And then we can go through it this way and add the points into them. So that's a couple methods that we can go through and actually get these identified and find all of them that are missing a map unit point and place a map unit point in them. With 47 of them, it's not too bad. It's easy to go through this list and put your points in. It's a little hard to keep track of this list. So one of the easiest things to do is, let's go back to, let's zoom to this one. So this polygon looks like it should be QFOC. So let's go ahead and put that point in there. 
what I'm going to do right off the bat is QFOC. Create features. Map unit points. Place my point inside. Switch to my attributes and call it QFOC. 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 Data source 007. So now we've corrected that point and we can see that it got the right color for QFOC, but likely I did that wrong. It looks like this is actually supposed to be oh, QFOC, QAL, QAL. So let's change that. Let's correct this point to be QAL, QAL, QAL. And let's edit this polygon area to match. And now we can see that the color of this polygon matches this one. Likely those are now labeled the same. Now, we don't have to make new polygons if we edit all of this information, but if we type it in once over here in the map unit points, we don't have to type it in also here. And this allow mul allows multiple users to be able to recreate polygons and preserve all of the information that was obtained and noted inside that map unit point. So it would be devastating to lose all of this information. So this is why it's important to go ahead and actually edit your map unit point information with the correct information here. Like we see here. So that's how we can edit a geodatabase that's already existing from a map package and how to extract a map package so that we can use it to the best of our abilities. You could, like I suggested earlier, go ahead and edit the map package directly and work in it, but it becomes a little tricky. Did you start editing version 10.5? Did you start editing version 10.0? It's one of the things we need to pay attention to when we open this up. So that's my word of caution and the reason why I go ahead and take that version that I'm going to work on, move it to a new folder and start editing that one. It's because there's technically two geodatabases that you could start editing and you don't know exactly which one you did, which one you started editing. So it's a point of um, warning, a point of caution. So this is how we can go ahead and add in polygons, modify existing polygons, and add in our map unit points associated with that. Notice that my test unit did get labeled, so that's another thing that we need to be careful of. Typos will also show up as a separate unit to itself. So if I were to accidentally had meant to type in TBIP here instead of test, I will need to go in and edit this point and now this polygon and it doesn't show up as a red warning polygon. So that's another word of caution. Let's pretend that we have made all of our edits that we want to make. We've made up all of our changes, we've made all of our corrections, we've added in all of our contacts, we've corrected all of our contact types, we've made polygons and now we're ready to package this and share it with our co-authors. The next step that we want to do is do exactly what our co-author had done for us, and that's make a map package. The map package bundles everything together. So these are the units, the polygons that I created. Let's go ahead and share this as a map package. And I'm going to save this into the folder that I created for the documents that I'm editing, not the ones I received, but the ones I edited. So I'm going to go ahead and go in here and make a map package.
here. So there's my designation, PLM007 from April 2018, and it's a map package. So we've specified the output location. Always make sure that include ge enterprise geodatabase data instead of referencing the data is checked. Let's go through and make sure that all of our item descriptions are correct. We'll add in a draft and update our missing metadata just in case anything's gone wonky or we've edited our metadata since we last made this package. You can add any additional files. And then the next thing we want to do is we want to analyze to make sure we don't have any errors, warnings, or messages, and then share it. And this takes a little bit of time. Okay, so now we can see that the map package is finished creating. What I'm going to do here is go through the process of showing where this is so that you can share it with your collaborators. So I'm going to click OK. I'm going to close the ArcMap document. And navigate to the location. So we have our Laguna folder that I was working on. And inside that version 10.5 folder, we now have a map package that matches what I have done. This is the file that we want to share. So if we were to upload this to our co-authors, they could open this directly, and it will open up exactly what we had done on our previous session when we packaged it. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up so that we can actually see that what we packaged is what we're delivering to the person who's collaborating with us. And here is our map package. So now we can see that we opened this new MPK up exactly where we saved it as. So if we wanted to do this in a more formal presentation format, we can switch back to layout view. reset our data frame properties to view the full extent of the mapping area at 24,000, 1 to 24,000. And we'll notice that since we have two map units, we have some issues that we need to deal with. So that's one of the things that we need to be careful about. But this is why we have a compiling author to work with. The compiling author should be able to take this information and uh, combine it with this or eliminate this altogether and make the units that we made coincide with the description of map units that was created previously. So. There's some things that we can do additional. There's some things that we don't need to necessarily do because the compiling author can do it. Or you can always contact me and ask me questions, and I'll go ahead and inform you the best method for getting this stuff corrected. As always, I'm your host, Phil Miller, from the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources. Remember to have a GIS day.